Hi there. Welcome to a lecture on linting in JavaScript. Today, we'll discuss linting generally, how it applies to JavaScript, and go through some examples. Let's get started. So what is linting? Putting it simply, linting is a method for finding errors in your code. It's a variant of something we call static code analysis, which means that it takes the code you write as an input and analyzes it in place. It doesn't attempt to compile your code or run it, it just looks at the text of your code to find common mistakes. Linting is useful because it allows you to avoid common mistakes or deviations from best practice. It's often used as a guardrail to protect you from the sort of small mistakes that might often slip your mind. It can do this effectively because it's fast. Linters run very quickly and can be integrated into your editor so that errors are reported as soon as they're made. The combination of detecting common mistakes and being fast means that linting is a big productivity booster. Linters hold your hand effectively while you code, letting you focus more on functionality and less on the quirks of whatever programming language you happen to be writing in. That said, linting is not a substitute for a good testing framework. It can only pick up on errors related to the language. It can't tell what you're trying to achieve and it can't detect runtime errors. Linting isn't a way to enforce good system design or architecture and it's not a magic bullet that makes your code work. On its own, it can't even detect errors where you're providing incorrect types, for example, a number instead of a string to a function. It's also not the only method of statically analyzing code, although it is the most common. Before we move on though, let's dig into some JavaScript history. JavaScript has a bit of a reputation as being a rough language with some odd behaviors. That makes sense when you consider its history. The first version of JavaScript was written in about 10 days by Brendan Eich, who initially wanted to take it in a completely different direction. And over the years, JavaScript has accumulated a lot of features and quirks that people probably shouldn't touch. And early JavaScript code was often buggy and hard to maintain as a result. So for many years, we languished in a time where JavaScript just sort of sucked, but it was our only option. Then in 2008, JavaScript The Good Parts was released. JavaScript The Good Parts detailed the parts of JavaScript that we should be using and the parts we should probably hide under the rug and forget about. While you may encounter some disagreement on the street, it's fair to say that a lot of modern idiomatic JavaScript code is built on the foundations of this book. So, why is this relevant to linting? Well, six years before the release of this book, the author, Douglas Crockford, released JSLint, the first JavaScript linter. You'll find in JavaScript that linting is used a lot. You'll generally find this to be the case in languages like JavaScript, Python, Ruby, and others, where the languages are dynamic and lack tyke systems. And the reason for this is really that there's no compiler and there's no type system. The language isn't very strict about what you can and can't write and tries to get out of your way, but that means you have a lot of room to shoot yourself in the foot. It's especially common in JavaScript because the language has a lot of bad parts. Linting helps us ensure we only use the good parts. And while JSLint was the first linter to be released in 2002, ESLint is now the JavaScript industry standard for linting. So how does linting work? Linting takes your code as an input. It's configured to have a set of rules. If an area of code breaks these rules, the linter will detect this and report these occurrences. Linting rules generally fall into two categories. You have possible errors and simple best practices, style, and so on. They can be configured with parameters and can be set to either warn you or report it as an error. When you run a linter, you can either run it as a command or you can set it to watch changes in your code. This means that when a change is made on the file system, it will automatically lint and report the results to you. Sounds simple enough, if a little vague. So how does linting actually work? Firstly, the linter has provided the code as a raw string. It passes the string and generates a tree-like structure, which we call an abstract syntax tree. This represents the program's structure. It's like a binary search tree, but with more than two nodes. Each node in the tree represents a block of code. The node also contains information about the line and column number, where the code starts and ends. Now the linting configuration has a list of rules, called a rule set. Each rule is a function that takes in the AST, the tree-like structure, and inspects it for patterns that break the rule. If it finds any, it reports them, plus where they started and ended. Fair enough, but how does it really work? This is an architectural diagram of ESLint which is the most common JavaScript linting tool. In here, you can see modules like a linter, a source code, rules, 
a CLI engine, and so on. So the CLI module is our user interface. It reads our user input to decide what to do. We have a rules module, and that defines our rule set. Our source code module is the module responsible for passing the code and generating the syntax tree. And the linter takes in the source code module and the rules module, executing the rules against the tree and reporting any errors that it finds. There are a whole host of rules available in ESLint, but let's take a look at some small examples. The no unreachable rule stops you from writing code that can't be reached. For example, if you have code that appears after a return statement, it will flag it as a warning or an error. No unused variable stops you from defining a variable and then not using it anywhere. And no use before define stops you from referencing a variable before it's been defined in the code. The last three rules were about detecting possible errors. The next three is more about best practices. The indent rule enforces consistent indentation in your code. The no var rule stops you from using the var keyword, enforcing the use of let and const, which were introduced with ES6. No console stops you from using methods on console. So how do we get started with linting? Luckily, you already have. Create React app comes bundled with a pre-configured installation of ESLint. So let's take a look. OK, you can see here that I've got a React application. On the left-hand side is my file, app.js. And on the right-hand side is a file called eslintrc.json. This is the configuration file for the linter and it sits at the root level of your project. You can see here that I'm extending React App. React App is a linting configuration that comes bundled with Create React App. On the left-hand side, I've commented ESLint Disable, which disables the linter. I'll remove it now. And suddenly, a bunch of errors are reported. The first error is a warning that the function is defined but never used. We also have some errors saying that some of our variable references are not defined. Additionally, we also have a return statement that doesn't reference the right variable and some unreachable code that occurs after it. First things first, let's reference our function by storing it in a result in our app and rendering it. This should remove the error on our function and you can see that on line five, it's gone. It's important to note that the linter can pick up errors, but some errors it won't notice. For example, I haven't referenced the correct variables here, and the linter won't be able to know which variable I was trying to reference, so it's up to me to fix this manually. I can fix the unreachable code error by just simply moving the for statement before our return. And you can see here that number multiplier is defined after its reference, so all I need to do is move it upwards. Great. So we fixed our linting errors, but our function still looks a little janky and there's still a few problems with it. What I can do is I can extend on our linting configuration by adding my own rules. The indentation here is a little weird. So first things first, I'll add an indent rule. The indent rule says that report indent as an error and look for an indentation of two. And you can see when I auto save, it automatically fixes the indentation for me now that I've added that rule. I can also see some usages of var when I'd rather there be let or const. So I'll add an error configuration to our rules. And when I autosave, you can see that my var reference up the top has been defined to let. This is looking a little better, but some of my variables are using underscores instead of camel case, which isn't best style. So I'll add a camel case error to my rule set. Sometimes a linter won't report the error until I've reloaded the file. So I'll reload it now. There we go. You can see here that all of the instances in which I'm referencing or defining a variable that uses an underscore have now been reported as errors. Unfortunately, the linter can't fix this for us because it doesn't know what the variable name should be. So I need to go in and fix this manually. Okay, 
So the naming is looking a little better, but there is actually a possible error in this function to do with the for loop. The for loop continues in the wrong direction, but luckily there's a linting rule that can protect me against this error. By setting the for direction rule to report as error and then reloading, you can see that my for loop now reports that the update clause in the loop moves the variable in the wrong direction. Simply changing this to an increment fixes that. In production applications as well, it's not really kosher to use the console statement, so I'm going to remove it. I can enforce the removal by adding a no console rule to my linting configuration. I'll need to reload the file again. And you can see here now that there's some errors to do with unexpected console statement, so I'll just remove anything that uses the console. And now I have a nice function. So you can see here that by adding a few rules to our linter, we were able to enforce best practices, good style, and guard against possible errors. This was an arbitrary example, but the difference that this makes in a large code base cannot be overstated. As a final note, the reason that we need to reload the file is because the linter is integrated into our editor in this case. If we change the linting configuration, the editor won't necessarily know until we have to reload the file, which loads the linter again. Great work. In this lecture, you've learned how linters work generally, how they can be applied to JavaScript, and you've seen a demo of how ESLint integrates into your editor to provide you a better coding experience. Until next time, all the best.